You're a kid. You do it. In the mountains up near Sandpoint, north of Naples, Idaho, eagles gathered there together to guard the truth so you might know. Down the road that followed Deep Creek at the turn that crossed the bridge, federal marshals had the roadblock to mark the siege of Ruby Ridge. There the armies of the enemy slayed your bride and only son Nearly killed your close companion when the shrapnel pierced his lung We stand with you, Randy Weaver, cause your Lord and Savior lives Wheresoever eagles gather, that is where his body is On that evening, late one August, you were forced to take your stand. There two strangers as they trespassed, do first blood on private land. Governor Andrus, back in Boise, let the enemy tell him lies. And from his anti-Christ decision, Sam and Vicky lost their lives. Federal agents, U.S. Marshals, and FBI men stormed the hill. All on false, fictitious charges, given orders, shoot to kill. We stand with you, Randy Weaver, cause your Lord and Savior lives. Wheresoever eagles gather, that is where his body is. surround us in the night there's a host of heavenly angels hovering near ready to fight we stand with you randy weaver we are proud to call you friend as we gather here together stand beside you till the end we stand with you randy weaver cause your lord Savior lives Wheresoever eagles gather That is where His body is Wheresoever eagles gather That is where His body is Hello everyone, this is John Lamb I'm here with Randy Weaver Today makes 26 years, 26 years since the, the injustice up there on the siege of Ruby Ridge. We um, kind of want to recap some of the stuff and that song there was by Carl Klang. Um, Carl Klang wrote that song for Randy when Randy was in prison uh, waiting on trial and um, Randy ended up getting to hear that song for the first time while he was in prison. It, um, today is the day that Sammy was murdered um, unjustly by federal agents trespassing on the Weaver property. And we just kind of want to just kind of go back through a little bit of it and just recap some of it. This, this incident that happened back in 1992 woke up a lot of people around the United States and around the world. Um, I think in almost every home around the country, they know what Ruby Ridge was. They know the name Randy Weaver and what he stood for. Uh, Kevin Harris and Randy Weaver, uh, several months later, on July 8th, 1993, uh, Kevin Harris was found not guilty on all charges that the government brought against him. And uh, Randy was found not guilty on everything but one charge, and that was failure to appear. And um, he was held for 18 months uh, in federal prison, or close to that, until December 
1993 for the failure to appear and um, charges that he should have never been charged with or even sitting there in prison for entrapment that the federal government did to him and his family. Um, I've been um, honored to meet Randy here several months ago personally and we've talked a couple of different times. I uh, met him in his home here a few months ago and uh, today again I, we, I wanted to meet up with him and just uh, let, let you guys hear his story again and just recap some of the stuff that happened and we've got to talk quite a bit today just just on different things just clarifying for myself and finding things but um, it was it probably seems like it was just yesterday doesn't it that it happened it's on yep just like I stand there at the phone there in the jail talking to Carl and he played that song over the over the phone for me to listen to and it made me cry then just like today yeah there was one thing that we talked about earlier that I had never known that before this, and you know, sometimes through years we forget things, but you ran for sheriff in your county there in Idaho about four years before this incident. 1988. There's a couple of reasons. Number one, I wanted, it would have been nice to be able to straighten the law enforcement out at the time, especially the federal agents, but also, I needed a job. Yep. That's what I told one guy <laughs> when I was on the radio one of three times. A guy calls in and says, why, why are you running for sheriff, Weaver? And I said, well, I need a job. And uh, he laughed, which was true. I need a job. I'm living for work. And, uh, but most important was to not let federal agents come into the county and mess with people wrongfully, which they do quite often, especially IRS. They, they really ruined a friend of mine, stole his property, started out saying he owed them $500 and Arthur said, no, I don't. Arthur worked 33 years for the railroad out of California and he was a genius when it comes to mechanics and electrical. He could repair anything, and uh, he's had like 33 years in the IRS contact him, said he owed him $500, and Arthur said, no, I don't owe you anything. He says, I've always done it right. Well, he was just hardcore enough that he knew what they was going to do to him, but he wasn't going to let him have his $500. So what he did was he sold out of California and moved up to Idaho bought a piece of property just down from where we built up the building there later. Built a nice piece of property, had good water on it, and uh, pretty soon here come the, Arthur was out, actually he was out, of, he was visiting people in Tennessee. The IRS come up there and, and put on a, a auction at the local courthouse. They must have had 40, 50 cops there, and there was probably 40 or 50 rebels and knotheads like me out of the hills that don't like the IRS and what they're doing. They were there to auction Arthur's property off, saying that he owed him like $60,000 now from the original 500. We all knew that was wrong. And you, that's what I run for sheriff sure for, to stop stuff like that. You, you fought for this country, or you was a veteran, and then you, you, you st took an oath to uphold the Constitution anyway. That was what you, I, and that was your intention to become sheriff. To, yeah, and I have never uh, give up on that oath. I still, I still believe in, in uh, defending the Constitution and this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and uh, so far in my lifetime, the biggest domestic enemy, the biggest problem we've had has been domestic. It definitely has. Yeah. Well, four years later, that came to your property. 1992, after you had ran for sheriff back in 1988, 1992, did you have a clue that day that anything like this was going to happen? No, if I'd have known that that was really going to happen the way it did, I would have gone off the hill and just turned myself in. But, uh, I think I would. My wife said, Weaver, you ain't going anywhere. 
And I told them, I said, if I don't leave the hill, kids, and go down there, they're, they're going to come up here and kill us all. Sam, Sam said, screw them, Dad. And Vicky said, you ain't going anywhere, Weaver. I said, okay, whatever. You, you know, might not turn out to good guys. Don't, you ain't going nowhere, okay? I wasn't going to leave them. They yes. weren't going nowhere. And the thing was, another big thing, the uh, guy that turned me loose when I, they kept me in jail overnight when they arrested me on the gun charge thing. The magistrate that I had to talk to the next day, he, he said, sign these papers and you can, it'll be a property bond. In other words, your property will be bond and you lose, you'll, we will take that property if you lose your, your uh, if you lose in court, we get the property. I thought, boy, that ain't right. But Vicky said, I turned around to my wife, she was there. And I said, you want to read this? She said, sign it, sign it. <laughs> Vicky was tough. Yeah. She, <laughs> she was. So, you, so you, already, her to do nothing. you gave your property up if you didn't go to court anyway, pretty much, is what they were saying. Yeah. You and still own that property today, don't you? The family does. My kids Yes, do. so yeah. they, did, they didn't take that property. Well, uh, actually, it was a $10,000 property bond, they call it. And when I got done in court, my fine was $10,000. So, Bo Greitz actually went to Las Vegas and collected $10,000 from people to pay off my fine. And uh, otherwise, they would have lost the property. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> well, that's the name of that too. Yes. Well, we know that um, on the 21st of um, 1992, Sam lost his life, and the next day your wife lost her life uh, by a sniper hiding up way up in the woods. Nobody can even see him. You probably didn't even, even if you wanted to shoot any of them, you couldn't see none of those uh, agents, could the you? The only one I saw was the first day when I was walking down the road to see what the dog was barking at. and. The guy jumped out and says, freeze, Weaver. I said, screw you, and I run back toward home. That's the only time I saw one. And if I'd have known that they were going to kill my boy shortly thereafter, I could have blown this guy's head off. I had a 12-gauge double barrel with number four buckshot in it. And he was close. I'm going to guess 30 foot away. I couldn't have missed. And, uh, but you had no intentions on killing anybody. No, you, no. You was, yeah. I've never aimed a gun to anybody in my life except maybe a BB gun when I was a kid. And we had BB gun fights once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> like you said, if you'd have known that was going to happen, if they'd have just asked you, you'd have came down off the mountain. Yeah. Oh. Except your wife didn't want you to. <laughs> no, because she knew that I was going to lose in court. And yes. There goes the property. Well, you don't get a fair trial, do you? No. Even in your trial, the jurors were the only hope you had, and that's what that's the reason you got the verdict you did. But the prosecution, in your trial, what I've studied on it and read, they hid so much evidence. They lied in court. The agents lied. They protected each other. And to get the, the grand jury to indict me to start with, oh, he was a Nazi. He went to the United Nations and all this. So what? You know, it's like. Yeah, well, maybe I should have gone to the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. There weren't any child molesters at Aryan Nations that I knew of anywhere or ever heard about. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that story. Yes. Well, the next, um, I guess, nine days after your wife was murdered there, that was some pretty scary days. You, you, you was wounded and shot. You got shot in your uh, left arm, your right, right right arm, right shoulder, right shoulder. Kevin was shot too. The same bullet that killed Vicky went through Kevin's left arm into his chest and lodged close to his heart. Broke two ribs going through. He was really hurting, poor kid. But uh, Sarah was feeding the the. Uh, Cayenne pepper. Uh, we put cayenne pepper in capsules. 
And people say, how did you eat all that cayenne pepper you don't? You put it in the capsule and swallow all the water. She'd give him two in the morning, two at noon, two at night. And it would take the swelling away and take the redness out of his, his he had a hole that big ripped open on this side of this arm. And it would and then it started turning black and everything and so you get like it was uh, being infection and she he'd take his cayenne pepper and he'd take all the redness out and and it was healing up. But uh Reading the book and reading the story about, you know, parts of it of Sarah's uh, uh, writings in here and your writings, Sarah did a lot. Your daughter, Sarah, she took care of Kevin and yourself those next nine days, trying to keep you guys alive and trying to take care of two younger sisters at the same time. For a 16-year-old girl, that was a, a she, she was very responsible. Responsible, yes. And she still is. Yeah. The day you guys um, finally... Um, Surrendered. I guess Kevin surrendered the day before. Yeah. The day before he surrendered, and he yeah. tried to make them a deal and say that he, he was, he pretty much said, "I shot the federal agent," trying to take responsibility on self-defense. But I, I, yeah. I shot the federal agent, and I'll take responsibility. Just let Randy and his family alone. That's, yeah. That's, I, that was Kevin. <laughs> that was Kevin. I mean, he, he was ready to take all the blame, and yeah. he wasn't even guilty of anything, but he yeah. was ready to take the blame just because they were trying to blame somebody. That was Kevin. The following day is when you turned yourself in. That was like the 31st of uh, August. Mm -hmm. And uh, turned yourself in. That was probably a hard day that day. You separated from your family. Your daughters were taken one way. You were taken to probably to the hospital and into prison. They put me in a helicopter down on the meadow. And they let me say goodbye to the kid. They used to give me a kiss. And then they were up and away and down the standpoint. And they put me on an FBI jet. <coughs> and uh, flew me to Boise and took me to the hospital there. And the nurse, after the doctor and everybody looked at my wound, went, Nurse was out there with a needle, and I said, what's that for? And she says, locked you. I said, lady, that's what I need right now. I don't want none of that. I didn't take it. She said, you can get it 10 years later. I said, I don't care. I don't, because I don't like to take that All stuff. All the vaccinations and shots, uh -huh. no. <laughs> no, and uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm still here and still kicking. Yes. Well, then just a few months later in April, you sat in prison this whole time. Where did you uh, get to see Kevin in any of this time, or was you in the same prison together? <laughs> we were in the same jail. They had four what they called max tanks. Uh, those were the bad guys, and you could just you know, there's eight eight cells in each tank, and they would move Kevin and I. We were in different tanks, and I'd look out the. Wendy into the hallway and there go Kevin dragging his We got so much mail pretty soon they just give us a <laughs> an, another uh, bed cover thing <coughs> to put stuff in that we got in the mail. And there goes Kevin dragging he looked like Santa Claus going down the hallway dragging his big bag. <laughs> and uh once in a while he'd see me looking at him and wave and that was it. But uh they tried not to do it so we'd see each other. But there, I don't know, must have been getting close to jury time, court time. And they, I think it was then yeah, that they let Kevin and I get together and just say hi and whatever. But that's it. When, he was in, when we were in jail, they, didn't, they kept us apart. Actually, being in the max tanks, we were better off than when we got out of the court. Well, we weren't bad guys anymore, super bad, so they put me over in uh, general population to wait till they shipped me out to Caldwell to a holding. They had a new holding pod thing built for old prisoners until they went off to either state or federal prison. And they just put me there. They didn't send me to get me to prison. They didn't want to put me through all the paperwork and stuff because I didn't have that much time left before they released me. 
but uh, general population yucky. Yeah. Um, Fifty guys in a room and with bunk beds and stuff, whereas we were by ourselves in the match. During, during the trial there, when it first started in April, your lawyer, Jerry Spence, came and told you about the Waco deal. So this was just a few months, you know, about eight months later, here we have um, another big massacre of American people in Waco. That was probably a big shock to you at that time, wasn't it? Well, we were in, let's see, it was uh, April 19th. We were only in court like six days. I mean, they burnt Waco out, and that was the first I'd heard about the Waco standoff. Mm -hmm. And there was the same guy, a guy by the name of Dick, his name fits him, Dick Rogers, was the head of the FBI hostage rescue team. They don't dare to rescue nobody. Anyway, he was down there and part of that fiasco. Ruby Ridge wasn't enough blood for him, I guess. But uh, he wasn't the only bad character down there either. It was too bad. You know, there's like four or five of them agents got killed. It's senseless. It is senseless. And it, it looks like to me, by some of the videos in Waco, same thing happened uh, in, your, in your deal there that Cooper shot Dugan. And. Um, Eight, them two, another agent, a friendly fire. Same thing in Waco. It looks yeah. like several of those agents were shot by their own people. Yeah. It, you know, they, then they frame it on the people inside, you know, oh, that's yeah. being had oh, the siege. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Deegan, the U.S. Marshal got killed, left our place. I'm, to this day, I believe without a doubt it was Cooper that killed him. And that's the guy, the same guy that killed my boy. But they're not going to admit to that. No. And uh, it's like that letter I was telling you about a guy. I, I told that guy, I didn't, didn't uh, don't forgive the guys that, that aren't sorry for what they did to admit that they were wrong. Because I'm not better than God. He only forgives those with a contrite heart. And uh, if I see some, oh, I was telling you that story about that uh, ATF agent that got shot by another one? Yes. Yeah, he uh, he had a real good attitude. Yeah. He was a nice guy. I felt bad for him. They told him to take his retirement and be happy. And, and he was trying to expose something that yeah. was wrong, some corruption, and he got a retirement and got shot by another FBI or ATF agent. Yeah. And then that ATF agent that was doing wrong got promoted. That's what yeah. we see a lot yeah. of happening. Yeah. The good yeah. cops are always fired. And, Absolutely. Or, yep. That's what I warned my grandson about. Yeah. So then we got uh, two months of trial, two full months, and then the jury gets the case and takes 20 days. I mean, it was, that's the longest deliberation in the history of of uh, Idaho, at least at that time. Longest court and Longest court and yeah. deliberation. And that was probably a, a, another moment in time that, um, Hearing all those verdicts come back, that was probably pretty emotional that day, I'm sure. Knowing Kevin was getting to go home and... You know, I heard they say, not guilty, they, they called Kevin's out first. Not guilty on every charge. I, he had either nine or ten charges. I had either nine or ten, I can't remember which was which. But uh, he got cleared on every one of his charges. And I was just crying and thanking the jury to let that kid go. Because he was innocent. And the jury, you know, they said later, even if Kevin was guilty, or uh, did shoot the marshal, he was in self-defense, so he wasn't guilty on, on that. See. Yes. But uh, now that Jerry Spence showed where one of Cooper's bullets went through Deegan's backpack sideways, it didn't hit his body. But of the bullet that hit the body, oh, they can't find that. They don't know where it is. They found all the other ones, but not that one. That's because they didn't, they did not want to admit that it was a friendly fire. Yes. Well, it, um, it's always enjoyable for me to sit down with you and talk. And sometimes I uh, can't think of everything again I want to ask you, but it, uh, if anybody wants to, wants to uh, purchase Randy's book, at the top of this live stream, I did um, put the address again. 
and how much they can they can um, purchase it for. I think it's twenty dollars plus four dollars shipping. Yeah, that's correct. And that that address we'll give it out again, but it's on the top of the live stream. It's three twenty Cooper Lane, uh, number thirty one, Kalispell, Montana, five nine nine zero one. And uh, again, it's at the top of the live stream, so you can um, uh, go back to the, after it's over with here and and take down uh, the address and purchase a book or a couple of them. And Randy usually will sign them, I guess, before you send them out if anybody wants them. Just note, make a note in the in the letter, I guess, that you would like a signed copy. Oh, I always sign always them. sign them. Okay. Unless they tell me not to. Yes. Okay. Because you know, if they if they want a book to maybe be worth. 50 cents next 20 years from now, they don't want them signed. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Well, Randy, as always, it's been an honor again to sit down with you and just uh, visit today. And and um, it's been... I enjoy you and your family so much. There aren't any better people in the world. I just love you guys. I know good people when I meet them. Well, it's, uh, it's been, this has been my lifelong dream meeting you, so. <laughs> I always, That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, <laughs> like I told you earlier, I, I used to think you was six foot four or something. I'm six I foot am. two. <laughs> but you're like. Wait till I stand up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, everybody, for joining in and watching and. That song we played at the very beginning of this live stream, uh, again, that was Carl Klein. You can find that music on YouTube, and um, it's a good song to download or save and and uh, listen to. Carl has done a lot of patriotic music um, for a lot of people, even even Waco and other people for around the country, and he's got some great music out there. But uh, again, thanks a lot for joining us, and hopefully we gave you a little bit more education on this uh 26th anniversary of the Ruby Ridge Siege. Thank you.